The Apostle Paul's first missionary journey that we looked at last week takes place between 47 and 48 AD. And then about a year later, Paul starts his second missionary journey, and this is between 49 and 52. And you can read about Paul's second missionary journey in the book of Acts. You'd start at Acts chapter 16, and you'd read to 18. And during this time, of course, he's going to revisit some of the churches that he previously visited, previously started. It's always good to check on new believers and see if they're growing and being strengthened in the Lord. But at the same time, he's also seeking out new believers and wanting to inspire and encourage new church growth. During this time, Paul also writes two books of the Bible. He writes first and second Thessalonians while he's visiting Corinth. At the very beginning, which for us is gonna be chapter 16 today, Paul and Barnabas are separated. Barnabas takes Mark and they sail to Cyprus. Paul takes Silas and they journey around the Eastern Mediterranean Sea and then in Syria and then Cilicia. And then Paul also begins mentoring Timothy. In Acts chapter 16, it says, so setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. Paul and Silas originally wanted to go to Asia and they just didn't ever feel like they had a direct calling from God to do that. And then Paul has this vision. He sees someone in Greece who wants their help and then he goes that direction. Verse 13 says, on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. So Luke tells us, Luke's our author, that this is the Sabbath, and Paul and Silas are expecting to find a synagogue in this city. They're going there just to pray. But as the text points out, there evidently is no synagogue in the city. Why not? Well, the Romans had evacuated all the Jews from their cities, and since Philippi is a Roman colony, this was probably something that was enforced. Plus, there has to be at least 10 male Jews in order for there to be a synagogue. And so, as Paul inquires about other Jews that are in town, he's probably told there aren't many Jews left here, but if there are any, you'll probably find them uh, a mile west of town down by the river. And Luke says when he gets to the river, he finds only women, meaning there aren't even 10 male Jews, and therefore the women who wanted to worship God, come down to the river to pray. They would go each Sabbath and pray in secret. Paul, originally when he set out, he didn't know what he'd find. In verse 14 it says, One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira and a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul, and after she was baptized, and her whole household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So instead of having a time of prayer, Paul spent some time in evangelism. Lydia was down at the river when Paul and the others arrived. She already believed in God. Paul got a chance to tell her about Jesus and that he was the long-awaited Messiah. She responds to Paul's message, and they... Uh, baptize her right there in the river. Paul had expected to go down to the river to pray, but instead Paul got the opportunity to share the gospel and Lydia and her household were saved and baptized. Verse 16 says, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. So as Paul and Silas are going, they are met by this fortune teller. And she's evidently pretty accurate because she has been making a good deal of money for her masters. But what a really odd picture. You'd assume that a fortune teller would be on the side of darkness. Last week, we met a court magician who tried to thwart Paul's efforts, but this fortune teller, who many people seem to know and to trust, 
is shouting that Paul and Silas were servants of the Most High God. She's telling people that they know the secret to be saved. She's endorsing them. She's giving them free publicity. The Bible says, and this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. So of course, Paul recognizes that something is wrong with this girl, right? Something's not quite right. Even though it may have appeared she was doing them a favor, she had a big problem of her own. She was demon-possessed. And the Holy Spirit within Paul caused Paul to feel so troubled about her that he finally turns around and he commands the Spirit to come out of her. And at that moment, the Bible says, that Spirit left her. Now what? Well, I'm sure Paul wasn't the first person to notice that something wasn't quite right with this girl. Other people probably noticed that she acted different. Surely everyone is going to be grateful that Paul has healed this young woman. I mean, for years, she's been tormented by an evil spirit. You'd expect people to be grateful that she is now freed from it. After all, who wouldn't want to have an evil spirit lifted from them? Surely people will be happy about this. Surely people will be thankful. Verse 19 says, But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in, attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So clearly, the owners of this slave girl, they're not happy. They were upset that she is no longer able to make them money. They're upset that she's no longer able to read people's fortunes. In fact, they're so upset, they seize Paul and they drag Silas into the marketplace before the authorities. They said Paul and Silas were advocating customs unlawful for Romans to accept or practice, probably because they're assuming Paul and Silas are uh, preaching Judaism. Then the crowd joins in the attack, and the officials order Paul and Silas to be stripped and beaten and thrown in jail. Roman jails, they're not fun. They were filthy. They were poorly ventilated. They were most likely underground. The prisons were divided into inner and outer areas, the inner parts more secure, more dark. Also, prisons didn't have individual cells. They would have had large groups of prisoners chained together in different rooms. The prisoners were designed to torture you, both mentally and physically, torture you into confessing. There was also very little rations. You had to rely upon family and friends to bring you anything you needed. But we don't see Paul and Silas moaning and complaining. The Bible says instead, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Paul has always had a positive, thankful attitude, no matter what. So it's no surprise that Paul and Silas would be singing praises to God while in this circumstance. Does anybody remember where Paul and Silas are? Where did we say they were? What city? Do you remember? In verse 11, it says that they are in Philippi. Remember what Paul wrote to the Philippian church? Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Paul didn't just write these words flippantly. He had already practiced what he preached. Paul and Silas have been severely beaten, locked in stocks, and now they're rejoicing. And I'm sure they were rejoicing because they were worthy to suffer for the kingdom of God. I mean, what else could it possibly be? What else could possibly happen on this really strange day? Verse 26 says, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. 
supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And they brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. An earthquake, an earthquake. Can you believe it? And not only do the prison doors fly open, but everybody's chains come loose. But you and I know this isn't some freak accident. It's not us. It's not us. This is not, you know, some sort of circumstance. This is an act of God brought out by this soul stirring praise service amidst very awful events. But that's still not all that happened. Something else unexpected. Apparently, being a guard is so easy that the prison jailer is asleep. The earthquake wakes him, and when he sees all the prisoners gone, he prepares to kill himself. Don't you think that in light of an earthquake, his superiors would have cut him a break? But through the darkness, Paul tells the jailer that they had not escaped. They got some lights in the inner cell, and sure enough, they find Paul and Silas inside. Why didn't you leave? What are you, nuts? Wouldn't you expect that to be his first questions? Nope. He had a more important question to ask. He said, who is it that you worship, and what can I do to be saved also? And then the story repeats itself. Did you notice? Paul and Silas expect to find a synagogue, but instead find women worshiping at the river. They share the gospel and Lydia and all her house is baptized. Paul and Silas expect to preach and heal in town, but instead they are jailed. They share, a gospel, they share the gospel with the prison guard and he and his house are baptized. What a crazy day. The events are far from what anybody would have expected. But the day is not technically over. Paul and Silas are still under arrest. The jailer probably snuck them out in the middle of the night and brought them back the next morning. He couldn't let anyone know that they had left. So let's look at how it all ends. Verse 35 says, But when it was day, the magistrates sent the police, saying, Let these men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. When morning came, they were told, You guys are free to go. Now, we might expect that when they're released, they would just go their way, probably continue to preach just like they had done in the past. We might expect that that's what the, everything, how everything would take place. They can go, right? Go in peace. Well, that's not what's going to happen. <laughs> they get a jail out of, they get a get out of jail free card. And you'd think that everybody would just take advantage of that opportunity. But you know, after a severe beating, after spending the night in the inner cell, that's not what happens. Verse 37, Paul says to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. So instead of using their get out of jail free card, Paul turns the tables on the Roman officials. Paul makes three charges against them. First, probably the worst one of all, he says, we are Roman citizens. It's illegal to beat a Roman citizen in public. 
It's also illegal to deny a Roman citizen a fair trial. And third, it would be illegal to throw a Roman citizen into jail without a trial. So if Paul wanted to press charges, those magistrates would be in a lot of trouble. So Paul says, hey, I'm sure you'd like to release us secretly and let us go in peace, but no. Instead, how about this? <laughs> what they have publicly done to us, they can come and publicly apologize. They can publicly release us. So the officials wasted no time. They got right down there. They appeased Paul and Silas, and they didn't press any charges. Why do Paul and Silas do this? Well, think about it this way. Remember, this is a church that does not have, this is a town that doesn't have a synagogue, doesn't have a church. So it's going to have a hard time getting off the ground. If Paul and Silas just sneak out of there, what impact will they have had? So having Roman officials come down and publicly apologize, publicly release them, that would change the whole perception of Christians in that community. Clearly, the expectation was that Paul and Silas would just use their get-out-of-jail card, they would count their blessings, they would move on down the road. But Paul and Silas used this opportunity once again to bring Christians a little public relations. And afterwards, they revisit Lydia and they encourage her. And what does Lydia do with her encouragement? What does she do with the reputation that Paul and Silas now leave her? She starts a church. This is why we have the book of Philippians, where Paul writes, I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership with the gospel from the first day until now. And being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul clearly has some very deep feelings for these people in Philippi. Clearly, he has had some deep conversations and they have left this impression on him. Perhaps he is thinking of them because as Paul writes Philippians, he is in jail again. He says, now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the Lord of God more courageously and fearlessly. Paul wants to remind them that he is in jail again, just like he was in Philippi, but he isn't worried. He says, just like I wasn't worried then. And even though he's in prison, he offers their little Roman church some counsel. And he says, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And then whether I come see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. In offering them advice, Paul reminds them how he handles persecution. He says, whatever happens, you have to conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. The Philippians may be persecuted, they may be imprisoned, but they must conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Paul said they would suffer just as he did, but they must conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. I'm sure Paul never forgot that day in Philippi. And you and I, 
we will never have a day like that. Talk about expecting your day to go one way and getting another. Remember, the whole day starts just because Paul and Silas want to visit some place to pray quietly. Nobody expects that when they wake up in the morning, they're going to get into a car accident that day or get fired. Reality does not always meet our expectations. And it's in those moments when we're caught off guard that it might seem okay to just throw something in anger or to swear or to punch a wall or to have that second or third or fourth drink. But Paul says, when reality doesn't meet your expectations, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. But what if I'm, in, I'm thrown in jail, illegally, unjustly? What if it's everybody else's fault except mine? Why do I get punished when the guilty go free? Philippians 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul says, rejoice no matter what. Worship, no matter what. Be thankful, no matter what. Remember earlier, I said Paul and Silas wanted to go to Asia. <laughs> Let me read you that part. In verse 6, it says, They went to the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging them, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. What did they conclude? They concluded that God had called them to Philippi. What would you or I be thinking after we had just received a beating and been thrown in jail? You know, I don't think God called us to Philippi. I mean, if God had really called them there, wouldn't you have expected a brass band to welcome you as you walked into town, people lining the streets thanking you for visiting? Whom did they find waiting for them in Macedonia? A group of women having church outside of town. A demon-possessed girl. A beating in jail. What do you do when things don't go the way you expect? What are that, what's that saying that they always say about lemons? The same day that Lydia's house is saved and baptized is the jailer's same day when his house is saved and baptized. And now, in a town that didn't have a church, now they have everything they need to start one. You know what I think? I think the jailer and his family started going to church at Lydia's house. And they shared all their stories of Paul and Silas about their bravery, their testimony. And as we head into these last few days of 2024, I'm sure there's many of us who could say, this year did not go the way we expected. You had expectations and they were not met. So how can I conduct myself in a manner worthy of Christ? A widely known prayer that we assume was written by American theologian Reinhold Neighbor says, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, 
the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. What's the meaning of that? It means it's hard to change what we can when we haven't figured out or accepted that it can't. But the truth is, we need to accept the things that we cannot change because most of it's in the past anyway. So leave it there. Let go of things that are over and done with. That's critical to embracing new possibilities of the future. This year, many of us will be deciding who to invite or where to attend a meal or a holiday with family and friends. What's gonna be the deciding factor for you? If you're still on speaking terms with them, how about this year, instead, you accept the things that you cannot change and you conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Let go of grievances and blame and expectations and forgive as Christ forgave you. You can be the earthquake that sets someone free. You can be the voice of good news crying out in the darkness. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these stories of Paul and Silas, of Barnabas, of these great missionaries who took your gospel out into the world. May we continue to be the hands and feet of Christ. When expectations do not go our way, help us to accept the things that we cannot change. Help us to let go, help us to forgive, and help us to move forward and to always conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of your gospel, that we might be a light to others and an example of disciples. Amen. Well, I just want to be the first to wish you a happy Thanksgiving. I know it's still a week away. And of course, a very Merry Christmas. Our church, we're going to be celebrating everything. Uh, we can't wait for Christmas and to have all the decorations up and to share the Christmas story with you. I invite you and your friends and your family to church. Come be a part of the celebration. Be a part of that community. We have two services on Sunday, one at 9.30 and one at 11.00. The 9.30 one is more traditional. The 11 o'clock one is more contemporary. Our 11 o'clock hour also has a full program for children from birth all the way through high school. And we want to be the church where you live. I'll see you soon.